I have a feeling this is going to be a little like rough and low rent. Uh, do you remember how to do this? No, I really don't. Why not? I've been busy. Well, I'm just saying, I mean, we're hanging out and I'm ill prepared and the dog is making sounds. So there's just no telling what's going to happen. That's all I'm saying. Well, you have to start with the date. Oh, okay. Hey, this is Swoopy, and you're listening to Skepticality for Tuesday, January 19th, 2012. Is that right? Yeah, that's actually my birthday, too. It is your birthday. It is. Science. See, it happened again. I was going to sing happy birthday, but I know that we can't do that, so I was going to sing George's happy birthday baby song, but I don't really have the suavity, so, you know, maybe someone will dedicate it to you. Okay. Happy birthday, baby. <laughs> How old are you now? Uh, 38. How old are you? No, you're not. Yeah. Oh, man, do you know what that makes me? What? I'm not going to say, but you know what that makes me. A little bit. <sighs> Man. It means you're 38. Actually, we're the same age right this minute. Yes. Yeah, okay. We are both 38. Okay. So you know what I was doing right before I sat down for the five minutes I had to be with you? Yeah. I was in the garage. Yeah. Well, before that, I was I was running. Yes. That's so. a good, you do that a lot anymore. Eh. Um. So I, I ran three miles, and then I mowed the lawn. But... I was trying to kind of straighten up a little bit. And you know what's taking up a lot of our garage? Books. Yeah. Yes. There's a lot of books in our garage. There's a lot of back issues of Skeptic Magazine and um, a lot of other stuff. And we've talked about it before. I don't know how much. I don't know what you've been up to while I've been busy, really. But I think I left a post-it on your desk that said something about we should start giving this stuff away. I gave away one of Scott Sigler's books. Uh, okay, that's one. Okay. One book. Yes. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> so we've got, I mean, boxes and boxes and boxes of books. We do. In cases and cases and cases. We have a magazines. library. But we've also had, we had some other like really cool different stuff too. And some of it, I don't even know where it came from. Some of it I do know where it came from but some of it I don't and so we need to figure out a mechanism whereby how about just like the first person that sends an email to hosts at skepticality.com saying I heard Swoopy tell me that I needed to write in for cool stuff gets a skeptical inquirer t-shirt and um, Maybe. it's a size extra large it's black so if you're a size extra large person or you know someone who's a size extra large person this is the t-shirt for you it's sitting here um, it's got the, the candle on it. It's really, really cool. I like it a lot, but um, it's it's not for me. It's for you. So send an email to hosts at skepticality.com saying, Soupy told me I could have this okay. in the subject line. And the first person that we get an email from will get the shirt. Maybe we do like like Woot, just the bag, the random bag of stuff. I don't know if I'm going to go that far. but <laughs> So if I have time to sit down with you from time to time and if you know people say that they like just a little bit of random you know us talking yes maybe every time we do that we can give away some stuff okay so today it's it's a skeptical inquirer t-shirt it's black it's size extra large and it's awesome next time it's going to be something even cooler so tune back in and it's it's a comic book of sorts, and it's autographed by the author, and there aren't very many of them, and it's skeptical. I'll have a couple of them to uh, to give away. Yeah, and it's also skeptical. So there's that. There's another item off my checklist. Start giving stuff away. It's not that we don't want it. It's hey, we want to give it to you, and be we don't have room for it. I want to keep getting more books. I mean, we got another book just today. Yes, we did. By Guy Harrison. Yes. I really kind of want to read it. Yes. Really kind of don't have time for extracurricular reading right now. I know, because you're always reading for something for school. Yeah. So for anyone who's been wondering where I've been, um, I've been, I'm a full-time student. I'm a, I'm a full-time employed medical assistant slash phlebotomist slash 
um, radiography technician slash many, many things that I do. At the hospital? At the clinic for more than 40 hours a week. And then I'm a full-time student and I'm taking 15 credit hours. So working towards uh, nursing school, which will, after that, be working towards a PhD. Well, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm jumping ahead. See, I want to get it all done. Then working towards my master's, then working towards my PhD in public health. But that's okay. Which means I don't get, I get to see you about as much as the people listening to this get to hear you. Yeah, just about. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that I don't love everybody, and it's not that I didn't want to keep doing this. It's just that, you know, I have, I have things to do in life, and there are many other people who listen to our program who are also in school, so they get it. Our dog misses you because he's making all the noises to say he's happy to see you. But from what I've heard through the, the grapevine, you're doing okay. Uh, maybe. I haven't had many complaints. Well, you know that that's what people do when they don't like something. Well, yes. If they like something, they don't say. If they don't like something, they complain. As long as we stay away from diet and video games, we're okay. So we don't need to talk about... <laughs> we don't need to talk about that you've been playing, what games you've been playing, and, and that, you know, in 2011 I lost almost 200 pounds. We won't talk about that because well, we'll get letters. No, we <laughs> well, true. So I guess, as typical fashion, we have skeptic history. We do have skeptic history. How is Tim Farley? I haven't seen him in a while either. Pretty good. Actually, he filled in for you for the New Year's show. Me and him just ranted with like this, but, you know, you weren't, you weren't here, so I used him. Tim Farley is the new Swoopy. A little bit. Tim's good. You also talked to Sean Faircloth, who I haven't yes. seen in a while. How's Sean? Sean is doing very well. He, of course, got a new job. Yeah. He, I, I, I even told him at the beginning of our interview, which we're going to play right after Tim, that, you know, the people who become the director of Secular Coalition for America, it's about a year-long, you know, job. I wonder if it's just so stressful that it wears people down. Possibly. And that's only, you know, how long they can put up with Yeah, because now the turmoils of lobbying Congress. <laughs> now Sean is the... Especially in an election year. Yeah, well, that'd be, that'd be true. Well, I have to plan uh, speaking to one of, my, uh, one of my classes, one of my psychology classes. It's the weirdest thing, being a college student now, because a lot of the, the classes I've been taking, especially in my science classes... I get this feeling, I mean, especially my psychology textbook, full of, of references for all sorts of people I know. Yes. I, I've What's told... also interesting is we also, we've often talked about how critical thinking isn't taught in schools. Now, while I agree this is, this is pretty true at the elementary, middle school, and high school level, at least where I'm going to school, critical thinking is a huge part of every course I've taken so far, even... Um, my English composition classes because when, with focus on research and sources um, and about finding credible sources and utilizing critical thinking to, you know, figure out which of these sources are appropriate to use and which ones you can trust. All of that stuff. I mean, I have I, practically the entire psychology class that I'm taking right now. It's all about critical thinking. Small textbook Carol Tavers wrote. You know, the 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 psychology textbook I utilized last term, every module had a section on thinking critically and examples. Elizabeth Loftus was heavily cited in that book. Carol Tavers, again, was heavily cited in that book. Michael Shermer was cited in that book. There was stuff about, you know, pseudoscience and unreasonable claims in that book. And so if this is something that is becoming a trend at more schools, hopefully, maybe the next generation is going to get it. You'd hope. But also remember, the school you're going to is the same one that has hosted people like Ben Radford and... Oh, yeah, we have, yeah, Kennesaw um, has, a, has a CSI group, and that's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of an unofficial member because I joined their group via Facebook, but I don't know, you know, the kind of things they're doing on campus right now. But even my philosophy class, the first section that I was pointed to referenced and was linking to something on the Skeptics Dictionary. <laughs> I think it was something on Aristotle. So, you know, it's, it gives me hope. And it's, it's a perspective I wasn't getting inside the skeptical community where we were decrying a lack of critical thinking being taught because where I am right now 
in the academic world, which is kind of mainstream. It's not, you know, because I'm not a graduate student right yeah. now, and I'm not an instructor, which, you know, many skeptics we know are. I'm just a regular old, you know, undergraduate student getting mountains of critical thinking. And, and thank you for all the things that I've read over the past, you know, five, six years, yeah. because I have mountains and mountains of material to pull from, and I have... You know, I have lots of built-in knowledge already. It's really making it easy for I me. Wonder, <laughs> I wonder why you got a, you know, 4.0 on your first semester. Well, I mean, it's it's, it's kind of unfair. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine if everyone was prepared this way going into college. You know, how much better they'd perform. They, they should be. In any case, so here's Tim Farley with this week's Skeptic History. You're driving west on I-64 in West Virginia. A few miles past Lewisburg, you see a sign that says Sam Black Church. It's for exit 156. You take the exit and you hang a left. As soon as you get away from the interchange, you see a white historical marker on the right. Look a little closer. The title on the sign is Greenbrier Ghost, and it ends with this sentence. Only known case in which testimony from ghost helped convict a murderer. Wow, really? A ghost helped convict a murderer? In court? Color me skeptical. I'm Tim Farley of whatsaharm.net and skeptools.com. This edition of Skeptic History, we've got three ghost stories. All of them involve murderers, accused or actual. All of them ended up in court. All of them had key events in the month of January, and it's highly likely that none of them actually involve a ghost. Our first story took place in London, England in the 1760s and became quite famous at the time. It was all recounted in the press, and there are many sordid details. But to simplify, a usurer, William Kent, had rented a house on Cock Lane and lived there along with Fanny, the sister of his deceased wife. There had been some reports of ghosts in the house. Kent lent some money to his landlord, the clerk of a church, and the debt went unsettled for some time. There was a lawsuit to recover the debt, and naturally bad feelings between landlord and tenant erupted. By the time the debt was collected in January 1762, Fanny had been dead of smallpox for almost a year. The ghostly sounds in the house, now occupied by the landlord and his family, returned. A minister was called in on January 5th, and using the system of one knock for yes and two knocks for no, an accusation emerged. Fanny had not died of smallpox at all, but was poisoned. The story spread, and Kent was not happy at being accused of murder. Additional seances were held on January 12th, 14th, 18th, 19th, and through the end of the month. In some cases, the accusations of murder were repeated. In other cases, no ghost appeared. All of this was reported in great detail in the press. In all of these seances, the landlord's young daughter Elizabeth was at the center of the proceedings, usually in her bed. Several of the observers, not the least Kent, suspected some sort of subterfuge, particularly when some of the seances went very poorly. A committee was formed to investigate, and the famed Samuel Johnson served on it. Eventually, the truth came out. The landlord, angry at having been sued over the debt, had conspired with several others to exact revenge on Kent. A trial was held, and at least five people were found guilty. Some were imprisoned from January 27, 1763, for a brief time until they settled their debt. Our second story involves not an accusation of murder, but an actual murder. It also took place in London, but 40 years later. In the Hammersmith area of London, near the end of 1803, several residents claimed to have seen and have been attacked by a ghost. It got to the point where armed patrols were set up to monitor the area. 
On January 3rd, 1804, a member of one of the patrols saw a white apparition on Black Lion Lane and fired his pistol. Unfortunately, what he had seen was not a ghost, but a man named Thomas Millwood. He was wearing the white clothes he wore in his work as a plasterer, and he had been killed. 29-year-old Francis Smith was charged with murder. Smith argued in his defense that he was acting based on his belief that he was seeing a ghost. The prosecution argued that he had not been provoked and therefore had committed willful murder. The jury tried to return a verdict of manslaughter, but the prosecutor would have none of it. He insisted on murder or nothing, and the jury agreed. The man was sentenced to die, but his sentence was commuted to a year's hard labor. A key issue of the case, whether a mistaken belief could be used as a defense, remained an issue in UK law for 180 years until it was resolved in a case in 1984. And the original ghost that everyone was fearful of? All the publicity surrounding Smith's conviction caused the original perpetrator to come forward. John Graham, a shoemaker, had been trying to frighten his apprentice by wearing a white sheet. And finally, let's find out about that ghost from the historical marker back in West Virginia. Zona Heaster had grown up in Greenbrier County. In 1896, she met a drifter named Erasmus Shoe and fell in love. He got a job in a local blacksmith shop, and the two got married over the objections of Zona's mother. She disliked this shoe fellow. They had an uneventful life for a time, but then tragedy struck. On January 23, 1897, Zona's body was found lying on the floor of her house by a young boy running an errand. She was dead. She was buried the very next day. Throughout the preparations and the funeral ceremony itself, her husband acted suspiciously. He allowed no one near the coffin. He insisted on putting a loose scarf around Zona's neck. Four weeks after the burial was when Zona's mother claimed she had appeared to her in a dream. She said the ghost of Zona told her Mr. Shu was a cruel man who had broken her neck in a rage. She went to the prosecutor with her story of the ghostly apparition. But according to contemporary accounts, there were already other reasons to suspect foul play. This included public outcry over Zona's death and the testimony of the local coroner who had noticed bruising on her neck. Zona's body was exhumed on February 22, 1897, and an examination showed that she had indeed died of a broken neck. Shu was arrested and charged with murder. He was convicted of murder and died of a disease in prison three years later. But did a ghost really help convict him? Well, probably not. For one thing, Shu's prior history of violent behavior had come out at trial. And when he took the stand in his own defense, he did not impress the jury. Zona's mother did testify about the ghost at trial, but only when questioned by the defense attorney who was trying to discredit her. Ultimately, it did not matter. There was plenty of evidence to convict Shu, and justice was done. But the strange account of the ghost convicting a murderer is still there on the metal plaque. That's it for this ghostly visit to skeptic history. Links to detailed articles about each of these stories are in the show notes. I highly recommend them for further details. The Cock Lane ghost story in particular has many interesting aspects I couldn't go into here. The other thing in the show notes, of course, are the locations online where I post a new skeptic history fact every day. So, Sean, it's been all... Oh... Wow, a little bit more than a year since we've talked to you last. Yeah, I would think, anyway. And last time I talked to you, you had taken over for uh, Lori Lippin Brown, and then mm. uh, you decided, like everybody else in Secular mm-hmm. Coalition, you decided to move on to something else. Mm. So what do you do now? I am the Director of Strategy and Policy for the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science U.S. Branch. Long title. 
Yeah, but we always want to make sure we say U.S. branch because there's a British uh, uh, nonprofit corporation as well. And uh, exciting for me is uh, I'm coming out with a book officially out uh, February 15th, Attack of the Theocrats, How the Religious Right Harms Us All and What We Can Do About It. Actually, that's why I had you here for now anyway. <laughs> Because I got to read the book, so I didn't, I didn't realize it was coming out that much later. I thought it was mm. out soon. It's, it's out, uh, you know, you can get advanced copies on Amazon, at the Richard Dawkins website, at Nook, yeah. so it's fine. It's a yeah. nice little book. It's very much like the speeches you've given mm. in the past. I noticed that. Yes. So it's a lot of the rehash of things you've talked about in the past, a little more detail. Mm. Well, uh, some parts are entirely new, uh, kind of framing the issue. For me, what I think is really necessary and what I hope to achieve with the book is we have had great writers Dawkins, Hitchens, Harris, Dennett, uh, many others, Susan Jacoby, uh, Jennifer Michael Hack, many, uh, who have really written very eloquently about both the history of and then the whether or not, if, if you will, regarding belief in God. And I think they were incredibly persuasive. I'm persuaded. <laughs> and so for me, the next question is, what do we do now? And the book is intended as a toolkit to sort of say, what can you do to help change society significantly? And, and that's what this book is really about. Because if I were to put my finger on the crux of the issue, it comes down to, uh, we can believe rationally all we want, but we have to face up to reality. Over the last 30 years, we've seen the rise of theocracy in this country like nothing we've ever seen before. They've been tremendously successful on the religious right. And frankly, uh, skeptical people, uh, secular people, humanist people, they have not uh, entered the fray in terms of American political life anywhere near to the same level and degree as the religious right. So this book is about let's do that. Let's get that done and let's start to change society for the better. And how, specifically? So what do you say to the people who say, well, the problem is we don't want to be like those people. That's the reason why we're not. Um, you are offering information to people about, as I describe in this book, many, many ways in which people are currently harmed by religious bias in American law. So I would uh, offer this book to a religious person who cares about separation of church and state and hope that they would agree with me. So it is not necessarily to say, you're religious, you're stupid, or that's not really the thesis of my book. My book is more, this is the harm. These yeah. are the many realities of harm from religious bias in law. Let's address those. And that is an alliance, if you will, that certainly should include the breadth from skepticism to humanism and everything in between among those who are non-theist in some way or another. But it should also be a wake-up call to many liberal religionists who I think to some degree, have their head in the sand in recent decades, because they're kind of thinking back, look at the wonderful days of Dr. King marching, you know, for yeah. freedom, and very commendable. I'm, not, I'm yeah. commending that. But that's not what religion is doing in America today, and let's look at it uh, on an evidence-based, merits-based scale, and then I think a lot of religious people would agree with what I'm talking about in the book. And then it sets out a specific plan to achieve those goals. So. No, I think it's very different from the religious right, because everything I do is based in, grounded in evidence, and I would say based in the values of Jefferson and Madison, as I describe in the book. It is important, I think, because I think there is sort of an above-the-fray uh, attitude among however you want to term this, whether it's skeptics or not theists, where we kind of say proselytizing, or something about proselytizing we find offensive. Yeah. Um, and I respect that, uh, but what I'm saying is we're not proselytizing for something that's not evidence-based or factual. We're saying, look at the evidence as what has occurred, and let's build a movement about returning to rationality. And I think, to some degree, we, we in the secular movement have a sort of noble flaw in that we're so focused on the evidence-based approach that we sometimes don't say, okay, but we have to re- think our strategy to persuade a broader America. Not in a way that's misleading, not in a way that's that's lacking in evidence base, but to say an emotional appeal that's connected to evidence might help persuade more people, and we need to start doing that. It, it connect to the hearts more than... Right, and then what I say is if you can open with the hearts and say, oh, and by the way, data supports what we're saying, then they'll ease their way into it with us. Whereas a lot of times I think we throw a bunch of studies and statistics out in the street and expect everybody to be rational like us. 
and it falls flat or it leaves people cold. And I want to say, let's bring him with that story and then let's move forward with it. And I really think there's tremendous hope. I mean, I know a lot of people are very discouraged with the religious right, but I think ironically, the religious right provides us a great opportunity because they're so crazy. Let's face it. I mean, you looked at Iowa. I was just in Iowa. I went and got uh, a tour with a local activist, a secular activist, and went to all the various, you know, uh, rallies for different candidates in the Republican caucus. And the level of theocracy, the, the blatantness of it, yeah. is really remarkable. And I really sincerely believe that your Joe Sixpack, your soccer mom out there, most of them, not all, but most of them, are reasonable people, and when they start saying, oh, you mean contraception, you'd take away contraception, it stops them short. If yeah. they, you know, if they say stem cell research, it would help my aunt with Parkinson's, it stops them short. And when you really start to accumulate all the harm from the religious right, and we approach it from that angle, I think we're going to get a lot more traction. And, you know, people say, well, you'll never persuade people on the right, but I see it all the time. When I travel around the country speaking as I do regularly, I meet people say, I was a devout Mormon, fundamentalist Christian, you know, devout Catholic, and now here I am at these meetings because somehow something got through at some point for me. And then once that door, you know, opened and rationality started flooding through, then they came over. And one thing I hope to do with the book is also for us, uh, for those who are secular, I think a lot of times because the media, naturally, they focus on Rick Perry or Michelle Bachman until she dropped out, those kinds of people. I like and, why they do that because usually that means they're going to fall out so early. All right. And also, it's uh, I understand, that's the horse race, that's how the media covers things, the very tip-top races. But one of the things I lay out in the book, I have a chapter called The Fundamentalist 50, and I could have written The Fundamentalist 100, I just picked 50, <laughs> but I took sitting members of Congress. These are not candidates. These are people currently among the 535 Americans who have power over 300 million Americans. I took 50 and just illustrated some of their attitudes and some of the wacky stuff they say, but because they're a member of Congress and not a candidate for president, a lot of times the media doesn't even notice. Nobody even pays attention, but yet they have tremendous power. And so I want to bring that out and let people know about it. And I think that's helpful for us because then it, it makes people understand this is not purely some future threat. This already happened. These people who are in Congress, the great majority of them, they were in state legislatures like I was, and they passed laws in, yeah. in state legislatures successfully. And I think a lot of times, even among secular people, they don't realize how pervasive this has been. Really, since the door opened, it was those pivotal moments from the, the Carter to the Reagan years when that door opened. And it's been open for 30 years now. And America's different, and people need to wake up to it. And I hope this book kind of offers that call, but doesn't just offer a call, but offers a, a plan to address it. And the alliance... Uh, between the religious right, which really a pivotal moment in American history was in August 1980, uh, Reagan went to a big convention of fundamentalists brought together by Jerry Falwell. And of course, under the law, you can't get the IRS exemption if you're endorsing from the pulpit, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, so he, uh, he said, well, I, Ronald Reagan said to Falwell's group of ministers, well, I know you can't endorse me, but I can endorse you. And he brought these people into the administration. And I'm going to be talking a lot about this during the coming year. In fact, I'm going to be talking about the rise of the religious right in terms of the infrastructure of the Republican Party. And it's not to be anything hostile to the Republican Party. Um, it's just not the way it used to be. I quote in my book frequently, of all people, uh, Barry Goldwater, yeah. who was called Mr. Conservative, Mr. Republican. I quote him a couple times because he could not stand the religious right. So you think, here was the guy who was the epitome of allegedly the most conservative Republican. He couldn't make it in Iowa. They wouldn't let him in. <laughs> he would not qualify because of his statements on church-state separation. So what a dramatic change in American society. And I'm hoping now that people, as they realize it, start to say, well, we have to do something. You know, and here we are, another American-focused version of a skepticality interview. I always <laughs> feel bad about it because I get a lot of e emails about it. But... <laughs> Richard Dawkins Foundation is kind of international in a way. Right. So are you doing anything overseas? We, I'm with the U.S. There's two Richard Dawkins Foundations, one based in Britain, one based in the U.S. And we sort of uh, help, and certainly our executive director, Dr. Elizabeth Cornwell, she'll help with some of his work in other countries, non-Britain and so forth. Uh, my job as director of strategy and policy at the Richard Dawkins Foundation is mostly based on the United States. And really, that's, that's a lot of Richard Dawkins in that. Uh, I went with Richard Dawkins. He was very kind to honor me to ask him 
uh, asked me to be his opening speaker this last fall, 2011, and I spoke at several venues uh, with him. And we went to Eastern Kentucky University, which is not even the big city of university. It's, yeah. I mean, of Kentucky. It's out there. And uh, Eastern Kentucky University, rural area, so-called Bible Belt, 2,300 people yeah. showed up. If, if uh, Senator McConnell, the Republican senator from Kentucky, said, I'm going to speak at Eastern Kentucky University, you wouldn't get 2,300 people. This, to me, is a catalyst for a movement. And Richard Dawkins, we've discussed this, really sees how important the United States is. I mean, for all of the situations that we've faced economically and so forth, we're still the most powerful country on Earth, and we have huge cultural influence. Uh, and when theocracy rises in this country, it affects America, which we all should care about, but it affects the entire world. And I think he cares about that. And so part of my job focus is how do we address that issue? Because if you look at Europe, obviously countries, you know, you look at Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and, and, and it's dramatically different where humanism is a major force in society, for instance, in, in Norway. And, and much well, Northern Europe is very... Right. And so I think he sees that for the U.S. branch, it's important to look at the United States and how can, how can we help make the world a better place and that America is a, is a pivot point. Maybe it's just cold weather. You know, Northern Europe, right. Canada. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's a cold, cold weather thing. I don't know. Well, I think there is a historical... I'm, I don't claim to be... Uh, I mean, I took history courses when I went to University of Notre Dame uh, when I was an undergraduate. Uh, but I do think there's something, some tie together with the American South and with the issue of slavery and the issue of fundamentalist religion. And a lot of those issues, in some ways, they still echo. They still reverberate to this day, and they affect all of American society. Great. Well, since it's starting to rain, mm. <laughs> and right. you have a, a speech talk to give, soon, yeah. let's, uh, let's talk soon. Thanks a lot. I really, really wish that me and Sophie could make it to the big re reason rally, which Sean and many other skeptics and rationalites will be at you know, up in Washington, D.C., if you have the time, and you can make it, I hope you seriously consider going. And also, if you do, please make sure to send me and Swoopy pictures and other fun memories so we can feel like we were there and, you know, kind of be sad. But it's a good thing. Sad that, you know, the good's kind of sad. <laughs> so, as always, show notes for this episode at our website, skepticality.com. Join our discussion forums at www.skepticality.com. Leave feedback by email at feedback at skepticality.com or by phone at area code 206-888-HOAX. That's 206-888-4629. This has been Skepticality. Thanks for listening.